On December 26, 2005, the History Channel aired a documentary on the history of the Antichrist. The only problem, of course, is that it actually avoided the history of the Antichrist. There are not too many major turning points in the history of Western civilization that have not been formed or affected as a direct result of the history of the Antichrist. So there's obviously a lot of historical highlights the History Channel could have covered, and it would have made for a very interesting historical documentary indeed. Instead the History Channel set forth three explanations to American audiences, in order to essentially give them the impression, the Antichrist was only something in theology at the end of the world, that the idea was probably nothing more than a simple common symbol for everyone's personal sins among early Christians, and that it was an old superstition in Christianity borrowed from Zoroastrianism's dualistic beliefs in good and evil, never even hinting there has been an entire millennium of history surrounding this topic, or that the history of the Antichrist has found its way to the center of virtually every major historic event we know from Western civilization, in one way or another. Permit me to say how much I... of the Protestant Reformation are standards of royal who sits on the throne was settled at the time of the Reformation and there has been no public debate among elected uh, representatives about these matters it seems that they're going to sweep them all away just because someone high up says we're going to do it well that is not democracy saying anything about the church. That's Roman Catholic people themselves 
who have been severely hurt and severely damaged and uh, surely they are entitled to express their views uh, about that publicly and to say why bring the Pope uh, to our country at this time when this is going on. Well, I think he's doing, he's working hard to cl close them up uh, uh, and cover them up. Well, King, there's been some surprise um, in the United States and also in Britain that you have a job in um, looking and investigating into terrorism and when your own um, past quotes uh, about terrorism, uh, and you're obviously anticipating what I'm going to ask you, uh, seems to be an apologist for terrorism. Um, you see, um, you were quoted as saying the following in 1982, and I quote you, if it is an accurate. Sure. We must pledge ourselves to support those brave men and women who at this very moment are carrying forth the struggle against British imperialism in the streets of Belfast and Derry. And you added that, um, what, three years later, you said, if civilians are killed in an attack on a military installation, it's a certainly regrettable, but I would not morally blame the IRA for it. Uh, the Shiite Muslims, or 20% of the world's uh, Muslims, believed that no man had the right to rule in God's name until the Messiah returned. As for the 80% who are Sunnis, they've never had a clergy. Um, for their entire history. And so modern day Islamism is attempting to bring about the very thing it despises, which is Western Catholicism before the Reformation. atrocious crimes against young young boys and young girls that they should be covered up and I think that is a very serious matter. Uh, that is not some Protestant saying anything about the church. That's Roman Catholic people themselves. The whole thing is it's not straightforward. We're not dealing with a straightforward issue. We're dealing with a twisted uh, presentation of this matter who happened to be a member of the fascist party. Now, the eccentric outsider is in power. Nicola Cucullo is the new mayor of Chiedi, elected last December in a landslide vote. The man who, as mayor, now visits Chiedi's schools to lecture them about the importance of cleanliness and right living is the same whose alleged views on Hitler caused a storm recently in the national press. Mayor Kukulo was quoted as saying Hitler was the most intelligent man of the century and his mistake with the Jews was not to have fried them all.
as you saw in part 1 of this video series, the history of the Antichrist is quite extensive throughout Western civilization. And it played a major role in the formation of modern society. And you saw that not only did Catholic theologians and intellectuals identify the papacy as the Antichrist, the founders and original confession of faith, of virtually every historic Christian denomination on earth, with complete unanimity, did as well. A unanimous, universal consensus, across the board, that could only be described as remarkable, by today's standards. You also saw that the claim proposed by the History Channel, that all the great Christian teachers, taught simply that the Antichrist was purely symbolic for everyone's own private struggle against sin, would have been virtually comical, if it had not been so egregiously deceitful. And lastly, you saw that the reason this history was suppressed by the History Channel, was because the History Channel itself, was actually run and managed, by people who had very close religious and ideological ties, to what had been known in that same history they suppressed, as, the Antichrist. Thus acknowledging its existence, the owners and managers of the History Channel, would have impugned themselves, therefore, you see the absence of this very same history in their documentary. In this video, the second lie set forth by the History Channel will be exposed. And it is fair to call it a lie, because once again, the extent to which the facts were manipulated and distorted to the public, could only leave the possibility of a very intentional misrepresentation as a plausible explanation. The second lie was the claim that the concept of the Antichrist was simply a superstition borrowed from Zoroastrianism. This of course, is an absolutely amazing attempt to dismiss the entire history of Western civilization concerning the Antichrist, by chalking it all up to a Persian superstition, rather than a biblical prophecy. And ironically, it was not the prophecies concerning the Antichrist which were the superstition which came from Zoroastrianism at all, it was the very thing the History Channel was attempting to defend and promote in its documentary, that being the practice of Christmas. And in this video, you will be shown why.
Most people often think that ideas found in the New Testament began uniquely within the New Testament only, but in many cases, what is found in the New Testament are not impromptu innovations, but more accurately elaborations and interpretations of pre-existing ideas and concepts which already had historical precedent in earlier Jewish communities. This is true about the doctrine of the Antichrist as well. Our English term, Antichrist of course, comes from the Greek used in the New Testament, where the Hebrew word Messiah is given the Greek word Christos. So we now have the term Antichrist from what was the Greek expression Antichristos. However, even before Christ was born on the earth, Jewish rabbinical tradition had already compiled a rather significant body of literature concerning the identity of the Antimoshiach, what Christians later called the Antichristos. And in these earlier prophecies and speculations we find some very interesting historical origins for the emergence of the idea of the Antichrist. None of this however was covered by the History Channel. Instead what the History Channel attempted to actually do with this historical information, was to spin doctor it out of existence and relevance. However, anyone who researches this topic will be amazed to discover the New Testament writers were actually elaborating and clarifying these pre-existing concepts. They were not simply ignoring them, they were actually building on them and elaborating. This is extremely important because once you realize the New Testament writers were elaborating, not inventing, then by going back to the earlier core Jewish prophecy material, you can see the actual historical context for much of this material in the New Testament. And as any scholar or serious Bible student knows, Understanding the historical context of scripture, is at least 50% of getting an accurate understanding of what the authors were actually trying to say, when they wrote their texts. Here is where the case gets extremely embarrassing for religious ecumenicals who want to consolidate all the earth's nations and religions under the papacy, the earliest Jewish prophecies, which the New Testament writers were elaborating on, make it also very clear that this doctrine is targeting prophetically the religious leader of the Roman Empire, at the time of the New Testament, known as the Roman Pontifex Maximus. The Pontifex Maximus was the religious title the Roman Caesar was endowed with as the head of all religion in the Empire. That title, during the time of Constantine, was transferred to the Roman Papacy. The Roman Pontifex Maximus is still with us to this very day, and he still carries that very same title, and he is still considered the head of all religion in the world. In Jewish tradition, the name of the Antichrist was said to be Armalus, and this name is actually very significant prophetically, because it is doing the very same thing in Hebrew, that we find the New Testament writers doing with the name 666. Precisely and exactly the same thing historically. Why is the name Armalus so significant? Because the name is actually a Jewish rendering of the very famous Roman name Romulus. Romulus was said to be one of the founders of the Roman Empire. So, by using the name Armalus, Jewish tradition was identifying the Antichrist as the religious head of the Roman Empire, or in other words, the Pontifex Maximus, by title. In the New Testament just exactly like in previous Jewish prophecies decades and even possibly centuries earlier, the name 666 was also a clear reference to a Roman ruler, because it was a Roman prenomen. The use of numbers as a name for a son, was a fairly unique custom, to Latin culture. Most people are familiar with names such as Octavius or Quintus, these are both number names, and 666, would be translated as the Roman prenomen name, Sixtus. And repeating the value three times, means it would be Sixtus the third. Literally providing a reference to what was clearly a Roman naming convention. Was there ever a Roman Pontifex Maximus by the name of Sixtus III? Actually yes there was, and you will never guess what he did in history. He was the most important Pope who ever lived, and most Christians have never even heard of him. And that is not by way of an accident, either. They would really prefer you not know who he is, unless you are Roman Catholic, then he will become rather important, as not only the founder of militant Catholicism, or in other words, burning people at the stake as heretics, but as the actual founder of the Holy Roman Empire, the beginning of the Papal Empire in Europe. But that is not all we find out about the Antichrist from earlier Jewish prophecy. 
Not only was the identification of Armalus used to demonstrate he would be a Roman Pontifex Maximus, his angel, the spirit that he would worship and be assisted by, was given the two names Samael and Belial. Now why is this so significant? Because the name Belial actually appears verbatim in the New Testament, and it is used by Paul, the former rabbi trained by Gamaliel. And what is amazing is that Paul uses this term in direct relationship to Christians who had slipped back into practicing Gentile idolatry, but claimed to be Christian. There he pulls out this reference from Jewish eschatology concerning the Antichrist, and makes the identification right away, that Christians involved in idolatry were of the Spirit, and were fulfilling the Jewish prophecies of the Antichrist. This specific piece of information concerning idolatry and Romanized apostate Christians is very telling and very specific concerning what the New Testament authors considered this future Sixtus person and those who would follow him to be. Not some other religious identity, but even as 1 John states, look to yourselves, it is clear the New Testament writers were looking at apostate Christians to be the source of the fulfillment of these prophecies. People who claimed the Christian identity, but were false Christians or as Christ put it, in the Gospels, the pseudo-Christoi. When you trace the term Belial back to its Jewish origins, you will find it is used throughout the Old Testament and it is used in some of the earliest material written. It is found in the Book of Judges, in the Book of Kings in reference to the false prophets of Baal, and in the Book of 1 Samuel. So you can see in Paul's use of the term, his rabbinical training had exposed him to the Jewish prophecies concerning the anti moshi and he was elaborating on these concepts with great specificity. And unlike what you would expect someone involved in a new religious movement to be doing, he was directly relating that concept to apostate deviants within the Christian community, who were sliding back into Roman cultural practices of idolatry and keeping the Roman pagan feasts in honor of them, such as December 25th, while maintaining that they were still followers of Christ. He makes it painfully clear, he considered these people to be the future constituents of the Antichrist, or as known in Judaism, sons of Belial. For religious leaders who are seeking to consolidate all Christianity back under the Roman Pontifex Maximus, within the context of the Vatican, also a notorious advocate of Christian idolatry, the same kind that was being specifically condemned by the Apostle Paul among apostate Christians, this is all very 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 bad news, and quite embarrassing to say the least. And the most amazing part of all this, is that the deeper you dig into this topic, the more and more obvious these problems become. If all this were not bad enough already we find another body of literature that makes the situation even more shocking, and this literature comes straight out of the Roman Catholic monastic community itself. Saint Pachymis was the founder of Catholic monasticism, or what people know today as the monastery movement, where all the Catholic monks live together in a community of celibates. It was located in Egypt and was the same community which produced the Nag Hammadi Library, a well-known treasure trove collection of Gnostic literature discovered a few years ago. In this literature which had been valued by the Catholic monks at St. Pachymis Monastery, as sacred literature containing a secret wisdom. This is the same secret wisdom, which was carried into the Catholic Church later as the secret unwritten apostolic oral traditions held as a quote, mystery, by Roman Catholic priests which were however, in actuality neither, but rather remnant practices of early Catholic Gnosticism from St. Pachymius Monastery. At St. Pachymius Monastery, they mention the Angel of Samael as well, the same character mentioned in Jewish prophecy concerning the anti-Messiah, but here they considered it a good thing, and they gave it the name Yolda, Beth. So what is so significant about this name, coined by the Roman Catholic monastics themselves, is that it ties the identity of this evil spirit directly to the papacy. How does it do that? Because, Yolda, is a direct reference to the Mithric celebration held on December 25th. Yolda literally means, quote, the nativity. In fact, the Persian name, still used to this day for that celebration is Yolda, and they refer to the Christmas tree, as a Yolda tree. And Bayoth means literally, listen to this very carefully, Bayoth means, to mass. The same word used as quote, the Catholic mass. As in Christ, mass. So the Egyptian Catholic monks literally identified the angel of the Antichrist as Yolda, Bayoth, and this translates into English as quote, the nativity mass. 
That is what the Catholic monks themselves named the Angel of the Antichrist, whom they considered not to be something evil at all, but a secret wisdom. Yolde Bayoth, the Nativity Mass. That is the very same entity the writer in the Book of Revelation referred to as the Angel of the Abyss, or Abba, Don, in Hebrew, and said, in Greek, he was known as Apollyon. Identifying this spirit, worshipped on December 25th in Rome, in three different languages. Obviously, if a writer identifies a false deity, prophesied to be worshipped by the Antichrist in three different languages as a substitute for the Biblical Christ, it is pretty significant in the mind of the author. And it also makes it very difficult for anyone to honestly, just accidentally, miss. Apollon was taken to Rome, and integrated with the Roman soul, and his nativity was worshipped on December 25th, before Christ had ever been born during the time of Augustus. And just in case you didn't get the full concept of how demonic Yolde Bayoth actually was, they even drew pictures of him as a gigantic snake with a crown on his head. As literally the king of all demons. So you see, this is why the History Channel attempted to skip all this material, and literally hide it from the public, on December 26th no less, by simply reducing all this to the claim, Judaism simply borrow this from Zoroastrianism. No they did not borrow any of it from Zoroastrianism, what they did was identify that Mithraism was going to contain some very important historic seeds for the anti-Messiah, which would prophetically identify him to the world. And that is 180 degrees different than what the History Channel reported to the public. What they did in their documentary on this issue, concerning Mithraic origins of the Antichrist and Jewish prophecy, to the public was really inexcusable propaganda, on behalf of the Roman papacy. But when you look into who owns the History Channel, then it all becomes very obvious why they took such a propagandist approach to this subject.
recently, Catholic theologians, counter-reformationists and rabbinical sources, advocating Jewish unification under the rule of the papacy of Rome, have attempted to deflect the origins and traditional meanings of the name Armalus, away from Romulus, back to a long-removed Persian source, which they identify as Ariman, the evil principle of the Persians. And this is the justification the History Channel used, in claiming the idea was borrowed from Persian Zoroastrianism. But this was not the thinking of Jews who invoked the name and wrote commentaries on its meaning in its earliest written forms, which appear in writings possessed today, from Constantinople in the 14th century. The idea this name is derived from Persia and is only a non-specific generic idea about evil, is actually only a recent historical revisionism that is not too interested in any actual history, and which erases centuries of traditional rabbinical commentary on the identity of Armalus still held into our own modern era, in which rabbinical sources themselves, identified historically and still identify today, the term as Roman, clearly understanding him as the religious head of the Roman Empire, or what is today, the European Union. As one rabbinical source explained, quote, Armillus must be understood within the context assigned to him throughout Torah literature. He is said to be the head of Edom, the king of Rome, as the name Armillus slash Romulus implies, and the ultimate enemy of the Jewish people. Armillus thus is taught to both sit as head of the Catholic Church and as head of the nations of United Europe, which today can be a reference to the European Union, end quote, and it must also be further noted, that rabbinical sources also clearly defined the Roman Pontifex Maximus in the form of Armalus, as also the Antichrist referred to by the Gentile. The identity was made to be, one and the same. The fact this ancient tradition emerges in literature during the Middle Ages is also of no small consequence. Because it was during this very same time, that Catholic theologians themselves, began to identify the papacy as the prophesied Antichrist of the New Testament. Long before the Jewish documentation of the Roman, Armalus, as the Antichrist, the Rabbinical Academy, in the first century, had been teaching concepts concerning the Anti-Messiah. And we find these Jewish concepts, originating in the Torah, reflected in the New Testament itself. The name Belial is precisely one of these very early historical sources, and this reference predates Armalus. Obviously, if Belial is used to refer to the Anti-Messiah and it predates the reference to Armalus, and Belial has no reference to Persia whatsoever, then the entire claim falls helplessly apart. And that is precisely what happens. Belial is first used in the book of Deuteronomy, one of the first five books of the Bible and also one of the earliest to be composed. The term, Belial, predates the reference to, Armalus, by at least, a thousand years. And Belial has no reference to Zoroastrianism whatsoever. In fact, what it does make reference to is once again, an amazing origin which dates the concept of the Antichrist to very ancient sources, and some of its earliest uses. None of which have anything to do with Persia or Zoroastrianism. The name Belial, like most of the references to forbidden deities in the scriptures, are an intentional twisting of the name, Belili. Belili was the Sumerian moon goddess, which later became the Greek goddess, Diana, and the Roman mother goddess, Artemis. Children of Belial, was a reference to the worship of mother goddess worship and its associated idolatry. Connecting this prophetically, to the identity of Armalus, the Anti-Messiah, or the New Testament Antichrist, was done by the Rabbinical Academy and is reflected in Paul's own use of the term. The term, Children of Belial, was also a loaded description because the first use of it in the Torah, was a reference to apostate Jews who turned away from Yahweh, to serve the Babylonian-inspired deity of the High Places. It denoted an element of apostasy, not simply paganism. It was a title that referenced the people who once had been exposed to the truth, but turned away in favor of a nationalistic betrayal. And, if this is not explicit enough on its own, the mother goddess Belili, was also the sister of the sun god, Tam Muse, mentioned in Ezekiel 8. The same that is worshipped by Rome, in its solar rituals on December 25th, and the second most important date, that being Easter, originally of the term, Ishtar the Babylonian mother goddess. 
so we see several very specific and important details about the Antichrist in the use of the term Belial by Paul and Jewish sources in the first century. They see him prophetically first ethnically and religiously as a Roman. Secondly, they see him as an apostate from the truth, not simply a pagan. And thirdly they associate him with the following very important practices. He is a Roman apostate who practices 1. Idolatry 2. Mother Goddess Worship and 3. The practices of sun worship associated with Tam Muse, formerly known as a sharp time signified by the constellation of the hair on the horizon, but now referred to commonly as Easter.
che vogliamo. E quindi siete colpevoli di aver devastato. The man who as mayor now visits Getty's school to lecture them about the importance of cleanliness and right living is the same whose alleged views on Hitler caused a storm recently in the national press. Mayor Kukulo was quoted as saying Hitler was the most intelligent man of the century and his mistake with the Jews was not to have fried them all. 